Certainly we are at a bit of a stalemate. Uh, we do see incremental gains uh, by Ukraine uh, as they commit to this counteroffensive over the summer, but we haven't seen anything to really uh, help them break through, you know, for example, to drive to the Crimea. Um, it's interesting to me, we, we tend to focus on some of the munitions that we, uh, the West provides to Ukraine as they fight this out. Uh, and we look at some of them as holy grails as they, they play out. So if you think of HIMARS, certainly that led to some sensational uh, tactical events. And then you see the Storm Shadow uh, missile doing the same thing. Uh, and now we're talking about dual purpose, uh, improved conventional munitions or, or cluster bombs. Uh, you know, none of these, unfortunately, are the holy grail uh, that Ukraine is looking for that I think will allow them in the near term to, to break through. This is my video update from Yerevan, Armenia on this Sunday morning, July 16. Let's talk about some news. And right now I am at the Cascade Complex here in Yerevan. And this is a must see if you decide to visit Yerevan, Armenia. And right down below on uh, the main square is, is a type of open air museum, a lot of nice sculptures. You have a whole bunch of, uh, of cafes and restaurants, and I think they're setting up for some sort of, uh, of a concert, perhaps this evening. But uh, this is a great place to come. You can work your way up the, up the steps, maybe get to the top up there, and you have a great view of the city. So let's, uh, let's talk about what is going on in the world. And we had this U.S. defense official come out and say that the big spring, summer, winter, fall, spring, summer, fall, winter counteroffensive is stalled. It is officially stalled, which is code for this big offensive has failed. So the U.S. Uh, defense official says that we are now in some sort of stalemate. And, uh, and he admitted that none of the weapons, the wonder weapons, have really worked. He said that the high Mars kind of worked. The storm shadows, he's like the storm shadows, huh? A little bit, but uh, he said every other weapon has failed to deliver the breakthrough that the collective West had been hoping for. Remember, the plan was five days to the Sea of Azov, split the Russian forces, disrupt the supply lines. The Russians would panic when the Ukraine military started to approach them. The Russians would drop their weapons and run away. That's what they actually thought. And we have many articles from Collective West Media saying as much. And uh, once they got to the Sea of Azov, then they would make their move on Crimea. They would eventually capture Crimea. And as uh, Budanov and Alensky and, uh, and Podolyak, as they said on many, many occasions, they would be fishing or swimming or doing something in Crimea this summer. That's what they were telling us for the last three months. And now you have the defense official saying that, yeah, we're, we're at a stalemate right now, which means that the collective West, NATO, this NATO proxy, the Alensky regime, they are losing. When they say stalemate, what they really mean is that they are losing. So the New York Times, they came out with an article the title is, After Suffering Heavy Losses, Ukrainians Paused to Rethink Strategy. Early in the counteroffensive, Ukraine lost as much as 20% of its weapons and armor. The rate dropped as the campaign slowed and commanders shifted tactics. So the New York Times comes out with an article where they admit that the Ukraine military has lost 20% of the weapons given to them by the collective West in this counteroffensive. From June 4th up to today, 
The New York Times is saying that the Ukraine military has lost 20% of everything they had for this uh, big counteroffensive. The interesting part to this article is that the New York Times, they don't talk about the casualties, like the people lost, the soldiers lost. The Russian Ministry of Defense, they put a number on it and they said 26,000 Ukrainian soldiers were lost in the first month and a half of this counteroffensive, which has failed to even reach the first line of Russian uh, fortifications. 26,000 lost. The, uh, the Collective West was saying, actually Stoltenberg, Stoltenberg was saying, as well as the Collective West media, he said that uh, Ukraine had trained... That the, that the Collective West had trained 60,000 60, Ukrainian soldiers for this big offensive. 60,000. That's the number that they put. And I'm taking the high end. I'm taking the high end. 60,000. Those were the troops that were going to go on this big counteroffensive. And according to the Russian Ministry of Defense, 26,000 have been lost. And I haven't heard anyone refute this claim from uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense. I haven't seen... Uh, Elensky or Stoltenberg or Austin or anyone come out and say, no, 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 we haven't lost 26,000. Even if it's 20,000 and they had 60,000 troops to begin with and they've lost 20,000, it's a disaster, a complete catastrophe for the Elensky regime. Now, let me pull up this, this article the Ukraine military lost 20% of the equipment it set to the battlefield during the first two weeks of its counteroffensive. The New York Times reported on Saturday this high attrition rate was reportedly a key factor in Kiev's decision to pause the operation. Beginning in early June, Ukrainian forces launched a series of attacks all along the front line from Kherson to Donetsk, advancing through minefields without air support. The Ukraine military lost 26,000 men and more than 36,000 pieces of military hardware, according to the last figures from the Russian Ministry of Defense. I'm actually reading uh, from RT right now, which uh, gives a good summary of this New York Times article. And we'll get into some quotes cited from, uh, from this RT article, which is referencing this New York Times article. Ukrainian losses were at their highest during the initial two weeks of the offensive, the New York Times claimed, citing unnamed American and European officials. These officials said that up to 20% of Ukraine's tanks and armored vehicles were destroyed in this period, including many Western-provided vehicles. For some units, Western equipment was lost at, a high, at an even higher rate. The Times continued citing figures from a pro-Ukrainian organization. Ukraine's 47th Mechanized Brigade, a NATO-trained unit, apparently lost 30% of its 99 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles in two weeks while the 33rd Mechanized Brigade lost nearly a third of its 32 German-made Leopard tanks in a single week. Quote, they all burned, said one Ukrainian soldier who witnessed at least six Western vehicles destroyed in a single Russian artillery barrage. Another Ukrainian fighter told the Times that his unit's Bradley's run over anti-tank mines on a daily basis while the troops inside often survive the vehicles are left immobil immobilized long before they can reach russian lines and then rt notes that russian president vladimir putin said that russian forces have destroyed a total of 311 ukrainian tanks since june 4th Quote, at least a third of them, I believe, were Western-made tanks, including leopards, Putin told Russia 24 TV on Thursday. So that's the New York Times article. Some more information courtesy of RT. And I think everyone that is watching this video gets the, uh, the overall picture. And once again, this New York Times article, RT talks about the 26,000 soldiers that have, uh, that have died, according to the Russian uh, Ministry of Defense. But the New York Times, from what I understand, they're not too concerned with, uh, 
with the death of these soldiers in this catastrophic counteroffensive, this failed counteroffensive. Lindsey Graham, this is what Lindsey Graham tweeted yesterday. The bottom line on the costs supporting Ukraine, zero, number one, zero American service members in combat. Number two, zero American service members killed in Ukraine. Three, a very small percentage of American defense budget has been spent to assist Ukraine's military. Four, the Ukrainian military in defense of their homeland is systematically dismantling Putin's army. Good deal for America and all who love freedom. Can South Carolina vote this man out, please? (laughs) Please? (laughs) You would be doing the world a huge service by voting this man out. Come on, South Carolina, you can do it. You can do it. So uh, (laughs) that's Lindsey Graham. That's how he views this conflict in Ukraine. He doesn't care about Ukraine. He doesn't care about the Ukrainian soldiers or the Ukrainian people. He couldn't give a flying F. To him, this is all about weakening Russia, regime change in Russia, destroying Russia. I mean, he said it. He's done many interviews where he said that uh, the ultimate goal is to, uh, to remove Putin or to assassinate Putin. He's even called for the assassination of Putin. For Lindsey Graham, Ukraine, the Ukrainian soldiers, they're, they're nothing to him. They're nothing to him. They're completely expendable, disposable, as long as they can, uh, what did Lloyd, Lloyd Austin once say? As long as they can give Russia a bloody no- nose. That's what uh, the Pentagon chief said way, way back in the uh, beginning of this special military operation. Point number four from Lindsey Graham's tweet. The Ukrainian military in defense of their homeland is systemically dismantling Putin's army. How? Putin's army is stronger than ever. The Russian military is stronger than ever. The Russian factories are, are, are producing jets and tanks at, at incredible levels. How, how exactly are they dismantling Putin's military? Russia has something like 10 or 15 percent of their military committed to Ukraine. And, and all of these, uh, these forces that have uh, been operating in Ukraine, they, they have combat experience now. How, how exactly in Lindsey Graham's puny little mind is, is the Ukraine military dismantling Putin's army, Putin's army. It's not Russia's army, it's Putin's army. It's not the Russian Federation's army, it's Putin's army. How come no one says it's Biden's army? Or Rishi Sunak's army? I freaking hate this narrative that, uh, that the neocons keep on putting out there, which is that uh, this Ukraine conflict is good for America. You see, we have no American troops there, which is a lie. We know there are American troops there. We know that there are American commanders there. We know that American commanders have been annihilated by uh, Russian uh, Iskanders and, uh, and Kinzals and Calibras. We know that. The Russians have hit decision-making centers. We know that there are American mercenaries in Ukraine. We know that American citizens have, uh, have died in Ukraine. So where does he come up with the zero number? Zero American service members in, in, in combat. He's very tricky with his words, huh? Zero American service members in combat. Zero American service members killed in Ukraine. I don't know. I think Lindsey Graham might have some explaining to do with that one. And a very small percentage of American defense budget has been spent to assist Ukraine's military. Yeah, 100 billion, 200 billion, 300 billion. 500 billion. Ah, it's a small percentage of the 1 trillion military budget that they just passed the other day, something like 900 billion, like the largest military budget in history, which was passed by Congress the other day. Ah, it's just, just a drop in the bucket. It's nothing. We can just print more money. Who cares about the American taxpayer? They can, they, they, they can pay for Ukraine. Who cares about 
allocating uh, money and resources to Ukraine when that money could be better well spent on education and health care and roads and infrastructure. <laughs> you know, that's, this is the mind of Lindsey Graham, everybody. And he says it's a good deal for America. This Ukraine project, Project Ukraine, is going to go down in history as the beginning of the end of the American empire. The end of the dollar as reserve currency, the beginning of the end of the dollar as reserve currency, the beginning of the end of the petrodollar, bringing Russia and China into into something more than an alliance. I mean, Russia and China are more than allies now. Uh, Germany in recession, all of Europe in recession, the U.S. soon to be in recession. U.S. military equipment. Here's one for Lindsey Graham, who's who's a puppet of the MIC. U.S. military uh, equipment weapons are like the, the laughingstock now of, of, of the world military community, if there is such a thing. I mean, everyone is making fun of patriots, for example, the Patriot Air Defense System. I know the Russians make fun of the Patriot Air Defense System. And there are rumors now that uh, Ukrainian soldiers are being trained to uh, operate the Abrams tanks, like a quick, speedy training uh, session is taking place, I believe, in Germany. A training course, a rapid training course is taking place in Germany for the Abrams tanks. Really? Really, America? You really want to throw the Abrams tanks into Ukraine so they can burn like the Leopard tanks? How has this been good for the United States? This is a disaster for the United States. It's been a disaster for Europe. I really, really hate that narrative that this is a good deal for America because they're using Ukrainians as a proxy to fight Russia. It's been a disaster for the U.S., a disaster for the American people, a disaster for Europe, a disaster for the European uh, uh, people, a disaster for, uh, for Ukraine. This is a disaster. Speaking of weapons, the F-16 is, uh, is being delayed by the U.S., this whole F-16 training program and getting F-16s to the Alensky regime. According to Politico, the U.S. is delaying it uh, a bit. But eventually it'll happen. But from what uh, Politico is reporting, the, the U.S. is trying to, to get all of the the tech in order and then the procedures in place so they can eventually train the Ukraine pilots. Politico says they're going to be trained in Romania. I've heard reports saying they're going to be trained in the Netherlands, maybe both, probably both. But uh, the U.S. is is delaying things a bit. And they're quite not ready to, to sign off on the F-16s, the excess F-16s, according to Sullivan, that uh, Europe is going to give to Ukraine and to get the training program underway, this rapid training program, program, a 10 week training program on an F-16 so that they can fight Russian pilots who have been training for God knows how many years on, uh, on advanced fifth generation fighter jets. And the Russians are going to destroy the F-16s. Putin said the Russians are going to destroy the F-16s, just like they destroyed the Leopards and every other wonder weapon. But the point of the F-16s, and here's the important part, the neocons know that the F-16s are going to, uh, are going to burn, that they're going to be shot down. They know that. The point is that the F-16s get the neocons one step closer to NATO involvement in Ukraine, which means U.S. involvement in Ukraine. That's the point of the F-16s. And Lavrov even said it the other day. Lavrov said, you know, the F-16s, they could carry uh, nuclear weapons. So Lavrov was like, you better watch it. Romania, Poland, Netherlands, all the countries that are coming up with this training uh, program and allegedly, supposedly, the, the F-16s are going to fly out of Romania or out of Poland because you can't fly them out of Ukraine because the Russians will destroy the air base in Ukraine. And so the plan, I guess, is to fly the F-16s from Romania, let's just say Romania. How is that going to work exactly? I don't even think the F-16s can, 
could make it all the way to the front line. Can they make it all the way to the front line from Romania and still be effective? Or are the Russians going to shoot them down before they even make it to, to the front line? But the point is to, to go the Russians into hitting targets in the collective West. In other words, what do the neocons want? And Lavrov sees this. Lavrov is, is way smarter than, than all of these neocons put together. Lavrov sees what they're trying to do because they can put a nuclear weapon on the F-16s. So this is a threat to Russia. They fly out of Romania. What does Russia do? Does it strike an air base in Romania? And if they do that, well, then the neocons have their, their NATO moment, right? They have their Article 5 moment. That's the point of the F-16s. The F-16s are not meant to make a difference in this conflict. It's all about pushing us a little bit closer to World War III. That's their goal. So here's Elon Musk's take on Ukraine, Project Ukraine, and the failure of the counteroffensive. And he has a much different view than Lindsey Graham. Elon Musk tweeted, Sending more weapons will change the body count, but not the outcome. I want the best outcome for the people. Russia has at least four times the artillery of Ukraine and 10 times the ammunition. We have run out of normal ammunition to send Ukraine. So now send them cluster bombs in desperation. They're basing ourselves with no change to the outcome. That last sentence is key. That last sentence is key. We have run out of normal ammunition, as Joe Biden admitted the other day, as Blinken admitted the other day, to send to Ukraine. So now send them cluster bombs in desperation. Exactly. Sending cluster bombs is desperation. It's proof that the U.S. has indeed run out of uh, ammunition. And so to keep this war going, they're so desperate that they're going to send Ukraine cluster bombs. Debasing ourselves with no change to the outcome. Yep. Even America's allies did not like the decision from the Biden White House to send cluster munitions to Ukraine. Even Germany, even the UK, even Rishi Sunak had to come out and say this is a step too far. So things are going so well for Ukraine in this stalled offensive. And according to Lindsey Graham, things are going so well that there are more reports every day that the Ukraine officials are grabbing people up off the street, throwing them into vans and sending them to the front line so they could be annihilated by Russian artillery. Zira Hedge, they ran an article, young Ukrainians scared to leave their homes as more and more videos emerge of forced conscription. And a lot of these, uh, these young men are being grabbed off the streets in areas like uh, Transcarpathia. So they're taking a lot of the, let's say the, the, the ethnic uh, Hungarians or citizens of Hungarian uh, origin, they're picking them up and throwing them to the front lines. They're picking up a lot of people in, uh, in Kiev and Odessa, and now they're even having to uh, pick up young men from the regions in the West, from Bandera land. That's not going to, to look so good for Alensky because he, he depends on the, the West and Bandera land to keep him in power and to keep support for the conflict going. And Zero Hedge also talks about how there's a whole bunch of corruption as well. And some young men are forced to stay in their homes. Others have to pay bribes when they're picked up. And other more wealthy young, uh, young Ukrainian citizens, they're, uh, they're able to pay off the, the officials that, uh, the military officials that grab them. And there's, let me pull up the article from Zero Hedge because they talk about the corruption. 
Give me one second to find the article. I know I bookmarked it. Here we go. And the corruption is really off the charts, like $7,000 some of these guys pay and and they're not sent to the uh, to the front lines. And there are a lot of military officials making a lot of money, like a lot of money from these bribes. Here we go. Many young people no longer leave their homes. There's always a risk. You have to be really careful and look around in cases there's in case there's any danger. It's really stressful, said one young Ukrainian man in an interview with broadcaster France 24. Why don't young people want to be drafted into the army? Because they know the price of holding the front lines. It costs thousands of lives, he added. Andre Novak, a Ukrainian lawyer and specialist in military affairs, said that corruption among military recruiters remains rife. And some conscripting officers are playing the system to get rich. Because of corruption, there are illegal methods to avoid the war, such as paying off the people from the armed forces or paying for a false certificate of disability. He told the French broadcaster, it is well known that military recruitment officers offices have become a hotbed of corruption over the last year and a half. In Ukraine, it is no secret that mobilization can be avoided for an average of $7,000. Officers can make incredible fortunes and some do not hide their newfound wealth, arriving at work in new luxury cars. Most recently, one Odessa military commander, Yevgeny Borisov, was found to have spent nearly $4 million over the past year on a luxury mansion on the Spanish coast, as well as nearly $200,000 on a luxury car. He also bought his wife a chain of shops on the Costa del Sol. If all this was not enough, Borisov was able to holiday in his Spanish palace, despite the fact that the borders have been closed to conscripts for a year and a half. But according to Lindsey Graham, this is this is good for America. I was also reading uh, Slavyangrad's Telegram channel, and they had this interesting post. The Russian army's rate of capturing Ukrainian POWs is increasing rapidly across every front of the war. Many have no idea what is going on. Untrained, thrown to the front, straight after, forcible conscription. They grab these kids up off the streets, they put them in a van, they send them to the front lines. Good on the uh, uh, on these kids, these young men who surrender. Good on you. Good on you. So what else should we discuss? How about the Alensky curse? It's now hit Ben Wallace, the defense minister for the UK, said, I'm resigning from politics at the next cabinet reshuffle. So Ben Wallace is no more. Another victim of the Alensky curse. And remember, it was Ben Wallace who just the other day said that uh, during the NATO summit that NATO is not Amazon. He was upset at the way Alensky was acting. And he said Alensky was ungrateful for all the, the money and weapons that the West has given him. And now Ben Wallace is resigning. <laughs> the Alensky curse strikes again. Modi. Modi's traveling around a lot these days. He was in France, met with Macron. And Macron and Modi said that they're working on a peace plan for Ukraine. And this is going to be a peace plan that's going to be much different than what the Chinese put out there, according to Macron. Modi? Yeah, Modi's serious to, uh, to find peace. He's serious about finding peace in Ukraine. Absolutely. Macron? No way. No way. Macron is, is a flip-flop BSer. This is all show. He'll say today to Modi that he wants to work on a plan for peace. And then tomorrow, when Newland calls him, 
Macron's going to be like, yeah, I'll send more weapons to Ukraine and we're going to we're going to fight Russia for as long as it takes. <laughs> that's that's Macron. The minute the neocons call him, he's going to he's going to cower and, and change his tune and talk about war and escalation. So while Modi visits him, he talks peace to Modi because that's what interests Modi. Modi wants to find a solution. He wants peace. And uh, as Modi leaves and the neocons ring Macron up, Macron's going to talk about war and escalation. Modi was also in the uh, UAE. And they decided to, uh, to strike a trade deal. India and the United Arab Emirates to trade in local currencies. In other words, more de-dollarization, moving away from the dollar. So that's how India and the UAE are going to be trading now in their local currencies. But according to Lindsey Graham, this is going well for the United States. This is great for America, right? Great for America. De-dollarization, great for America. And I think we can get to a clown world. I'm trying to think if I have any more stories here. Syria, everybody, keep your eye out on Syria and what's going on there, because there are reports that the U.S. military is thinking up, cooking up some sort of retaliation against Russia, Iran, Syria, because the U.S. military is upset. Now, get this. The U.S. military is upset that the Russians, Iranians, Syrians, that they're... Uh, from what I understand, they're taking out these U.S. Reaper drones that are operating in, uh, in Syria illegally from the illegally occupied territory that the U.S. has. So the U.S. is illegally occupying Syria. They're illegally flying these Reaper drones in Syria and... The Syrian government would like the U.S. out. They would like these drones to be shot down and to not fly over Syrian airspace. And this is angering the U.S. And now the U.S. is thinking of some sort of a response, a military response to Russia, Iran and Syria. So keep an eye out on Syria and we can now do a clown world. And in this clown world, we have a bunch of cancellations. We have the Alensky regime canceling Orthodox Christmas. So according to a new decision from the Alensky regime and the Ukraine parliament, Christmas will now be moved to the 25th of December. So it aligns with the U.S., the collective West, Europe. Greece has its Christmas, the Greek Orthodox Church. They changed their Christmas to December 25th as well, many, many decades ago. So the Orthodox Christmas, the Russian Orthodox Christmas at least, is being canceled. So that's one cancellation. The Alensky regime, they also decided to, to cancel Russian culture. So like no Russian music in Ukraine, no Russian books. No Russian language, no Russian theater, no Russian literature, art, nothing. They're canceling it all, which when you think about it, canceling Russian culture for Ukraine is like canceling your own culture. <laughs> I mean, you cancel Russian culture. It's like canceling yourself, right? That's essentially what the Alensky regime is doing, canceling their own, their own history, their own culture, their own society. Oh boy, and now we get to the funnest clown world, and this is just speculation and a rumor. But there was this image from the NATO Vilnius summit with Elensky and his wife, Elenska, taking a, a group photo with everybody. And you can see they're kind of holding hands, maybe not holding hands. She grabs Alensky's hand, and she moves her hand away. Then Alensky grabs her hand, his wife's hand, and his wife moves her hand away. And there are some people 
saying that the next person that's going to be canceled is Elensky. <laughs> so Elenska may be canceling Elensky. <laughs> Maybe. I, I think it's a possibility. I think it's a possibility. One of my favorite memes from that NATO summit was the one where, obviously the one where Alensky is standing there and he looks very, very annoyed and upset. But there's the one meme which has his wife uh, talking with like another uh, NATO official or wife of a NATO official, whatever. And she's there holding her hand and she's happy and she's talking to, to this person. And someone completely erased Alensky from the photo. You're seeing the picture right now. <laughs> In this meme, he's not a janitor. He's not, uh, he's not a NAFO dog or anything like that, like all the other memes have, uh, have portrayed him. He's completely vanished in this, uh, in this photo, this photoshopped photo. And I think that may be the true fate of Alensky when all of this is said and done. And if that does happen, I'm positive that Alenska is going to cancel Alensky. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's the video. I'm going to end it there. A real, a real quick bit of news that just came in. The Ministry of Defense of Russia said that this morning an attempt by the Kiev regime to carry out a terrorist attack by seven drones and two unmanned semi-submersible boats on objects on the territory of the Crimean Peninsula near the city of Sevastopol was thwarted. Two Ukrainian UAVs were destroyed by air defense systems over the Black Sea at a great distance from the coastline. Another five UAVs were suppressed by electronic warfare and crashed without reaching their targets. So they tried to attack Sevastopol. The grain deal is finito. With this attack, they've absolutely guaranteed the end of the, uh, the grain deal. Let's walk this way. Let me take you. Let me take you this way. So that just happened just now as I'm filming this video. And, and there was also the, the attempted assassination attempt, the, the attempted assassination attempt, the attempted assassination of uh, RT's editor-in-chief and uh, the FSB. They thwarted this, uh, this assassination attempt. And, and from what I gather, it was, it was from a bunch of teenagers who were paid money by Ukraine Intel to try and, uh, and eliminate RT's editor, editor and chief. We, we're seeing the Ukraine uh, Intel sources of the military. They are targeting officials now. They, uh, they assassinated that submarine guy, a submarine commander the other day who was out on a run. He was killed. And now they're going after the RT editor-in-chief, or they tried to get Margarita Simonyan. They tried to get her. This is Budanov and Delensky and Zaluzhny and Danilov, all of these guys that are putting this stuff together. Remember, Zaluzhny, in his Washington Post interview that he gave the other day, he said that, uh, that he's the one that organizes all of these attacks on Russian territory. Budanov has admitted that he's the one that orders all these terrorist attacks that have taken place in the last uh, year and a half. Daria Dugina and, and all of these uh, attacks on journalists and civilians and and politicians. This is what they're now resorting to. Going after journalists. So that's the video, everyone. Coming to you from Yerevan, Armenia. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, Bitch Shoot. Telegram and Rockfin and go to the Durant shop, 10% off, use the code. Good day, take care.